Guten Morgen, guten Tag, guten Abend. Let's together discuss the extended Lake Victoria Basin's water cycle, as well as future scenarios we can use to evaluate current infrastructure and development plans. The extended Lake Victoria Basin is located in East Africa and covers five countries, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. What we're looking at is a map of precipitation, or specifically in this case, rainfall. Areas of deeper blue show higher rainfall than areas that are white or transparent. It is a density map and will change as we zoom in. So areas that show darker or deeper colors or stronger colors show more rainfall than those that are white or transparent. Zooming in, we see that Lake Victoria is in the center of our extended Lake Victoria Basin. Lake Victoria herself is the second largest lake in the world in terms of surface area, second only to Lake Superior in North America. As well, the extended Lake Victoria Basin, or Lake Victoria, is one of the headwaters of the Nile Basin. You see the Nile River winding forward, ending up with this green patch at Egypt at the end. Called the extended Lake Victoria Basin because the Lake Victoria Basin ends with Lake Victoria, and what flowing out of Lake Victoria wouldn't be strictly considered within this. Because Uganda is a strong component of the Lake Victoria Basin Commission, the extended Lake Victoria Basin is an interesting delineation. So the Lake, extended Lake Victoria Basin includes the water that flows out of Lake Victoria and through Uganda and to the border of Uganda. Now let's look at evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is the water that evaporates from soils or passes through plants and transpires. So the water that's used by forests, by wetlands, by agriculture, and by grasslands. This is sort of a heat map or a, a transpiration map, evapotranspiration map of the water that transforms from liquid water into vapor over soils or through plants in the extended Lake Victoria Basin. So we see this is, uh, we see stronger points of this uh, towards the east but generally evapotranspiration happening all over the basin. The last map we look at is discharge, so the amount of water flowing through the rivers. Zoom in, we see some rivers flowing into Lake Victoria herself, then the water flowing out of Lake Victoria, as well joined by the water flowing towards the western part of the extended Lake Victoria Basin, all culminating towards the border of Uganda. The water cycle the extended Lake Victoria Basin includes inflows and outflows. So there is no snowfall, so all the input is rain. So of all the rain falling over the basin, most of it, in this example 60%, and this will range year to year, is leaving the basin or being consumed as evapotranspiration. So of all the rainfall that was falling over the basin, 60% of it left the basin through evapotranspiration. What's left over? is this discharge. Oh, in fact, in this case, discharge is a, a smaller component, lake evaporation. So evapotranspiration, the water that's churning from liquid water into vapor through plants or over soils, is the largest output of the basin. But given the sheer size of Lake Victoria, 34%, again, this is, this is average, or this is just an example year, it will change your tier, 34% is simply evaporating over the surface of the lake. Now, a relatively small component, around 5% in this example, is leaving the extended Lake Victoria Basin and moving downstream past the border of Uganda. Let us look at future scenarios. What we see here is rainfall over the extended Lake Victoria Basin from 1900 up until 2050. So from 2020 to 2050, we're using different scenarios to simulate a range of possibilities. These come from two sorts of scenarios. One is climate scenarios, which are called the RCPs, the Representative Concentration Pathways, discussing different concentrations of greenhouse gases within the atmosphere and how this may affect the climate. The other scenarios are SSPs, or Shared Socioeconomic Pathways. These discuss how the human community might develop into the future with cooperation, less cooperation, more migration, less migration, 
So here we see from 1900 to 2020 the historical precipitation over the extended Lake Victoria Basin, and from 2020 to 2050 a range of scenarios built off combinations of these SSPs and RCPs. We see that the years of the lowest precipitation are similar to the lowest years of precipitation in the extended Lake Victoria Basin, for example, as was seen in 1927, but this was still an extreme and mostly isolated event. So we can say that perhaps the years of dryness will be similar to the most extreme years of dryness experienced in the last century, although they may occur more often. When we look at the years of wetness, we see that they are significantly higher than what was experienced in this last century. Again, this just provides a wide range of reasonable results. I wouldn't bet on any of them, but they can be used to test the current systems and infrastructure and particularly support developing into the future. So we can say that the years of extremity might be significantly higher than what has been experienced in this last century. Let's just also put this y-axis to zero to show that the extended Lake Victoria Basin generally has significant rainfall. Again, it is spatially uh, heterogeneous. It is not evenly spread throughout and the extended Lake Victoria Basin. But we see from here that years of dryness may be similar to the most extreme versions of what was experienced in the last century, but years of wetness may be significantly higher than what was experienced in the last century. So the range of extremity can widen, as well as the occurrence of these wet years and these dry years may increase. Uh, here's another way of looking at it in a box whisker plot. All these dots represent an example of annual precipitation for the last century. So we see the lowest points, again, are uh, it was an extreme year and we don't see we see something maybe as similar to it in the past so we can simply say the extremity of the dry years coming into the future or from 2020 to 2050 can be similar to the most extreme year in the past century but when we look at years of wetness we see that the highest point which is again an isolated experience or generally an outlier compared to the other years of precipitation is not as high as the highest years or the occurrence of high highest precipitation in the, in the coming years. It can also be interesting to discuss how population and GDP or economic development will change water demand moving into the future. What we see here is water demand from industrial, domestic and irrigation sectors from 1970 to 2020 or 2015 and then from 2015 simulating into 2050. What we notice under all these scenarios is that domestic demand increases significantly. All right. What can the extended Lake Victoria Basin do to prepare for changes moving into the future? Seeing the range of extremes widening, as well as the occurrence of extremes perhaps happening more often, as well as domestic demand significantly increasing moving into the future. Good luck.